this is one of the topics that's kind of nearest and dearest to my heart, which is why I proposed this panel. I was really excited uh, to then be able to invite these incredible leaders to, to join and, and share. And essentially, in, in the work that we do at Candy Group and working with families and foundations that want their money working for justice, there's two principles that we think a lot about. Um, so one is this idea of nothing about us without us, that we should not ideally, and, and I would say that these are principles we wrestle with. These are not principles that we've mastered. These are kind of open areas of inquiry, I would say, for us and for impact investing and social enterprise in general. The idea of having communities engaged in design, governance, and ownership of what's happening and not just being treated as recipients or beneficiaries, but being protagonists and a recognition of the idea that people closest to problems will know solutions. And beyond that, should get to make decisions about how funding is happening. So the second concept that we have to really wrestle with in our daily work as impact investors is the idea of the golden rule, which is that the one who has the gold makes the rules, right? That often it's investors who get to decide what impact is, regardless of what their lived experience might be or proximity to the problem. And that what we try to wrestle with is how do we ensure that those with greatest proximity to issues get to make funding decisions. And we're seeing increasingly that savvy donors, investors are really thinking about rather than spending a lot of time making a lot of small decisions about how to build a portfolio, they can make one big, really great decision, and that's to turn over decision-making power. And what we have is three amazing leaders on this stage who have done that through grants, through debt, through equity, through different models of community engagement, different uh, criteria of how they think about community and what community means in their context. And I'm really excited for them to each in our first round um, to introduce themselves, to share a bit about the work they're doing, then all take some time to go through some questions, diving more deeply into those models, and then we'll open it up to the room. Um, so we're going to go left to right here and start with Esperanza Payana. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Esperanza Payana, I'm Executive Director at Food and Farm Communications Fund. We are a movement-led participatory grant maker and have been implementing this process since about 2019. Uh, my own journey in this process has been throughout my career, actually, in uh, designing various participatory processes, first through programs and then in working with financial institutions um, to embed that process, whether it be through community advisory boards, um, or, uh, you know, more, more in-depth processes, let's say, um, and serving to the, in that capacity as well. So have served on um, as a founding chair of the Oakland uh, Soda Tax Advisory Board, um, supporting budgetary process, and also am on part of the Resource Council with Potlickers Capital, which is also a community advisory board to them. Thank you. Um, well, I don't get enough opportunities uh, to get to publicly recognize how grateful I am every day um, to get to work alongside my colleague Leslie Lindo, uh, Managing Director of the Olamina Fund. Um, so I, I guess I'm, I'm excited that not only get to hear about the work, um, but just the incredible integrity that Leslie brings to the work every day. So thank you for that. Great. Thank you, Morgan. Um, yeah, so Olamina Fund is um, one of the loan vehicles at Candide Group. and. We focus on um, racial and economic justice, primarily investing in the Deep South, Native American communities, and rural America. And really kind of the intention is to create access to capital and resources in communities that have faced historic disinvestment and extraction. And so it's just been such an honor to, I think, work with communities across the country and really understand what's happening on the ground and um, I think similarly to Esperanza come from a, a long history of nonprofit work which I think um, you know I don't think folks really recognize how important that is to bring into the finance world of having really kind of the social services background um, and also serving on other boards that have really done a lot of experimentation on what it means to have more distributed and demo um, democratic governance models. Um, and so that's one of the um, 
things that I'm excited to share and what inspired me to um, really build out our community advisory board the way that it has been and excited to talk about that with you all today. Um, yep. So I'm um, the Chief Growth Officer at Village Capital, and Village Capital is a global organization um, working primarily to unlock capital uh, for entrepreneurs with lived experience who are building innovative solutions for uh, emergent social, economic, and environmental um, uh, problems. And um, so advancing equity and democratizing decision, investment decision making has been a foundational aspect of our mission uh, since uh, our establishment. And we've developed a number um, of frameworks and tools um, uh, to advance that. So uh, our pioneering peer selection uh, methodology works basically to mitigate um, uh, gender bias um, in the investment decision-making process and also works, um, you know, to address the, the power imbalance between the investors uh, and the entrepreneurs. And this year we, um, we uh, published um, another tool, uh, the Smarter Systems uh, Framework, which uh, allows investors to tweak their due diligence process uh, to be able also to mitigate uh, gender bias and helps them unlock further uh, investment opportunities that they would have naturally overlooked as well. And um, we've also uh, deployed our Capital uh, Explorer tool, which is uh, an online uh, diagnostics uh, financing tool, which helps entrepreneurs identify the type of uh, funding structure that best suits their uh, uh, needs uh, needs. So it's not just channeling the right type of capital, uh, uh, channeling capital, but also channeling the right type of capital uh, for those entrepreneurs, while at the same time mitigating uh, biases. So uh, yeah, uh, and prior to that, I ran an entrepreneur support organization. I'm from Jordan, and I worked very closely with entrepreneurs with lived experience. So I bring this, you know, experience, and I know what the challenges that they are facing and how they are uh, uh, overlooked uh, by investors regionally and, and globally. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much. Yes, and you get to see the real range of community-driven grant, oh, that's a tongue twister, community-driven grant structures to a debt fund with a community advisory board component in making those in investment decisions to a more uh, convertible debt equity um, having entrepreneurs and cohorts where they actually get to vote um, that peer selection that Reem um, alluded to of they're the ones actually voting of who the investment capital is going to. So three very different mechanisms that they're going to have the opportunity to go uh, more in depth uh, into um, and certainly want to invite you to share more about the particulars of your model. Um, and I want to start with Leslie. Um, and knowing that in, you know, Olamina launched as a, as a new fund, um, and actually the first time that Candide had ever done a fund, and, and there's a lot of folks who maybe, are any fund founders in the audience? I know we got lots of different communities out here. Um, people know that when you're starting a fund, there's a lot you got to do, right? There's strategy, there's legal, there's team, there's, you know, many, many different elements to it. And having a community advisory board might seem to some folks like an extra, you know, this extra thing that we got to build and manage and, and support financially. Um, but I would say that for us as a team, um, the idea of having a community advisory board really felt like an essential component of the model, um, that it wasn't an add-on. It was absolutely at the heart um, of how we were thinking about approaching U.S. community development. And I would love to hear more, Leslie, about um, why this was such an important feature um, for you to develop in your leadership, um, and then also how you've seen that evolve over time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think one of the other um, important aspects to note is that um, our, the investors in the fund were also fully supportive of the concept of having a community advisory board, and I think that's really critical of you know, having that buy-in right from the beginning. And really the intention for the community advisory board um, was to really advise on uh, the strategic direction of the fund, participate in credit decisions, and you know, really 
flip, you know, the traditional power dynamics that we see in finance. And so kind of going beyond just representation, um, but also really having the decision making authority. Um, and so that, that, as you're kind of alluding to, really has evolved as we've um, formed the Community Advisory Board, um, really having, um, I think, their voice be more front and center. And um, what that's looked like is um, participation in our credit committee where they are involved in um, really influencing the, um, the types of loans that we make as well as making the credit decisions on uh, which loans we're approving. And so really kind of that active engagement has been an important piece. And it really meant a lot to us to have um, community advisory board members who um, not only had, a, like some had a background in finance, but also having folks who did not, so that it was a learning opportunity for them and something that they could bring back to their community. And it was also really important for the um, participants in the community advisory boards to be, um, have a shared lived experience of the communities where we lend. So we're bringing in that perspective as we're thinking about the types of loans we're making, the structure of our loans, as well as who we're lending to. And um, one of the intentions early on was that it would be kind of two people at a time would sit on the community advisory board. And as uh, we were evolving, the entire community advisory board said, well, I want to you know, be able to participate in this as well and not just kind of cycle in and out. So that's, I think, one of the shifts that we made in, from the initial design that was really brought um, forward by the community advisory board members. So that's something that's really been exciting to see. And then we've also even shifted our legal structure so that the community advisory board can have veto authority over loan decisions and be the ones to actually approve or decline a loan um, without having to have uh, like a Series 65 license in you know the financial sector. So. Great. I really appreciate the detail on the different steps and opportunities and moments for engagement. And I know um, often you've spoken to the importance of the broader principle of sharing power. And I'm curious, what are some of the steps um, that you've been able to take to share power in the context of the Community Advisory Board? Yeah, um, so I think it's interesting. It was kind of like you're bringing on the Community Advisory Board members and really kind of getting them up to speed, but not wanting to seem like we're managing them or the leaders over the Community Advisory Board. So we had to be really thoughtful in how we um, engaged and built that relationship and um, so we very much see ourselves as facilitators of the work that they do um, and, and support them um, in, in the ways that they ask of us. And, um, and in our meetings, we're really leading with like, what is their decision? What is their experience telling them? And um, even when we were kind of in kind of the training around them participating in a credit committee, we really learned a lot from them um, in terms of what are the important metrics that we want to look at when we're um, underwriting an organization. And, um, and it was just such a dialogue that it actually even shifted some of the ways that we do our due diligence. Um, so I think that was something that was really important. And also, you know, as we're thinking about launching the next phase of the fund, one of the things that we talked about with them early on was having um, you know, a, a questionnaire for potential investors of, to really kind of test values alignment and authenticity. And, um, and we're working with the community advisory board to develop that questionnaire and then they'll be the ones who will make the decisions about which investors get to invest in Olamina. Fantastic. Thank you. And I think that's a really important element, right? The idea of saying, once again, that it's not just about those with money automatically having the privilege uh, to be able to take credit. One of the things when I um, used to have to fundraise in the nonprofit context, I used to think, I'm the one who has to do all the work, and you just got to write a check and put your name on all my good work. You're lucky to get the opportunity to claim credit for this, right? And I think that's where we see increasingly people saying, we want to make sure that our investors are equally aligned, that they're um, holding themselves accountable to their values in a much broader way. So appreciate that ethos. I want to turn the ream and back to the village capital model. Um, 
and peer selection. I know I first uh, encountered uh, Village Capital back in 2007, that VILCAP has been around for quite a while and was really one of the first to raise their hand to say, wait a minute, maybe a different set of decision makers should be at the table. I'm curious to um, explore more, what are the mechanics of how the peer selection process actually works, works from kind of day one in the room to yeah. when that decision is made and what's some of the outcomes that you've seen since I, I guess it was 2009 was actually the start. Yeah, um, as you said, we've been around for a number of years and we've uh, tested the peer selection methodology with, with hundreds and hundreds of, uh, uh, of entrepreneurs uh, across the globe. So in principle, I mean, this is how it works. So with the support of an advisory board, we also set up an advisory board for every uh, program. We intentionally select a very small cohort of entrepreneurs between 10 and, and 12 entrepreneurs who are uh, who have an innovative solution to a problem that we want to uh, address. So once we select uh, those entrepreneurs through a very intentional uh, uh, process, and here commonality of stage and uh, sector is critical because what we're doing uh, throughout the program is putting the small cohort of entrepreneurs in a room, in a space uh, for a number of hours where they're, um, you know, uh, assessing one another, giving uh, feedback. So they need to understand the space that they're all coming from. They need to um, uh, share attributes, um, um, uh, be very well aware of the problem that they are, uh, you know, addressing the challenges that they are uh, facing. So for peer selection to work, commonality is very important. And this is why the selection process is a very intentional and, and rigorous uh, uh, process. Now, facilitation also plays a very big uh, role because our program managers, while they're facilitating those discussions and those sessions, they need to ensure that there's this trust that's being built you know, between the entrepreneurs. It's a safe space for them um, to share um, you know, information about their businesses, the challenges uh, that they are facing. Now, throughout this process and through many hours of, of discussions, entrepreneurs learn how to become investors. And in the process, they're conducting a peer due diligence on the businesses of the cohort members. And we've, we have a structure for that, of course, um, and we get them to look at eight verticals um, within the business. So they uh, conduct a due diligence on the team, uh, the problem, the solution, um, uh, financing, uh, uh, market, scalability, uh, exit opportunities that they're providing for the, uh, uh, for the investors. And throughout, it's, it's all about impact uh, as well. And then they rank across these verticals how those businesses, in their opinion, you know, where they should be uh, uh, ranked. And those uh, rankings need to be, of course, validated with, uh, you know, feedback. Why do they feel that this company needs to be ranked low along that specific vertical, or they should be ranked, you know, given a higher rank? Now, the highest ranking uh, companies by the end of the program ends up receiving the investment or the grant that has been uh, allocated for that uh, program. Now, what have the results uh, been? So we've been doing this, as I said, for many years, and we've tested it on, on many entrepreneurs. So are entrepreneurs capable of assessing the commercial, commercial uh, viability of their peers? And is the peer selection process really working, you know, towards mitigating the gender bias in the investment decision making? The, the short answer to both questions is yes. So um, uh, we've tracked, we've done a study tracking um, uh, the peer selected or the ranked companies along a period of five years. And we've seen very clearly that Companies that received the highest ranking went on to generate the most revenue and to raise the most capital, where the companies that, you know, ranked, ranked the lowest, you know, did not do as well. And in terms of um, the mitigation in the gender bias, um, we found that women 
um, or let's say female founders or co-led uh, companies that are female co-led uh, were assessed based on the commercial or based on merit. So they were not crowded out. They were fairly assessed and they received the ranking that, you know, uh, is, uh, you know, uh, that goes along with the, with the commercial and viability of, the, of their business. Now, um, sorry, one more minute. Now, while the intention of the peer selection methodology was to democratize the investment decision making and deal with that uh, whole imbalance of power, but also we had an, an amazing unintended outcome out of this, which is the peer learning, because it's such a rigorous process and we're putting in place entrepreneurs who have the, you know, all those shared attributes uh, that feedback that is given throughout the, the ranking process, which is done three times, by the way, it's an extremely rigorous uh, process. Uh, they come out so, you know, much more ready uh, in terms of, uh, you know, being investor ready uh, uh, to talk with investors and they're in a much uh, better position. So even if there's no financial element or an investment attached to that program, uh, they're still very excited to take part in our programs because of that peer, that whole peer selection and peer learning component of our program. It's amazing with that level of intentionality and with groups that tend to be 10 to 12 entrepreneurs that that is um, very strong intention at a very specific scale and yet Vilcap is all over the world, right? Has achieved tremendous scale in its model and curious how you balance that element of real depth whether that's in a geographic area or in a topical area and the idea of scale and how you think about scaling the model. Yeah, I mean, the, the whole, the, the way we design our programs is we start with a problem statement, right? So we start with the problem and then we recruit the entrepreneurs who have developed the solutions to be able to address that problem. So it is very much uh, a place-based, you know, uh, uh, design for, for any program. So, and that's why we've been able to do it all over the world successfully because we select a geography or, you know, and, 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 you know, assess what type of issue that we want to address here and then recruit the entrepreneurs accordingly. But then, as I said, I mean, this is a very hands-on process. And it requires very careful facilitation and a very rigorous selection process, uh, extremely hands-on, and the use of tools that we've developed. So how can we, as an organization, you know, running uh, acceleration programs for, you know, a, a very small cohort uh, scale all of this? So four years ago, we started to think, you know, critically about this. And we've developed tools to be able to also support entrepreneur support organizations because they're the ones on the ground. They know what the local issues are because we're designing the programs to address specific problems. So they're there, as you, you know you do with your uh, fund as well. So they're there, they understand what the issues are. So we, we've developed programs to build their capacities, their value proposition, uh, uh, to devise a strategy, how can they best serve the, the local community and the entrepreneurs um, and help, you know, advance uh, solutions for the challenges that they are facing as well. And we also work with them to support the entrepreneurs that they're supporting. And also because we're using all these amazing tools, um, of course, the use of technology is going to be very important when it comes to scaling solutions. So. Um, all of our tools are um, embedded into our online uh, product, Abaca. Um, uh, so all those diagnostics tools that I, I mentioned are there. And um, so that helps with the scaling as well. Thank you. I'm excited to turn to Esperanza with, um, I have a practical question and I have a philosophical question. Um, and the practical question is just to explain more about how your participatory model works. But the other piece that I recognize that from the beginning, we've kind of taken for granted the concept that this creates better outcomes, right? The idea that uh, this, is, this is driving towards something important um, for those of us who care about social justice. Um, and I wanna unpack that assumption a little bit and how do you think about what success means in the context of a participatory model? Thank you, yeah. So um, 
we're a communications fund, which means our, our grant making is really driven towards supporting communication strategies, which is a really broad spectrum of strategies. Um, we provide grants, we provide technical assistance, coaching um, through third party providers, and we provide a lot of connectivity. Communications is a primary tool of organizers. So as I mentioned before, we are movement led. So that's really important to us when we're thinking about where are we going, what do we wanna see happen in this world? We are working towards systemic change through the lens of agriculture and food systems. So we know that we, you know, we have a shared vision um, and we're always looking at how, how are we driving that? How are we lifting up narratives? How are we putting out a counter narrative? Where are, the, where are the various ways that we can make that happen? And how do we strengthen our ability to be unified, to be coordinating, and to strengthen those organizers? So that's really the, the premise of our fun first, you know? Um, so to be effective in that, particularly around the unification and coordination, um, that's really important. That is partly why this is a participatory process, to make sure that we're having strong impact and we're actually working with the movement leaders who, either, some of them are, are uh, grantee partners of ours, um, they're communication strategists, and they're folks who just have years on the ground and know what it takes. They also have reach, very much what, what Reem had mentioned around um, place base. We're national, and um, having the kind of reach that you need in those spaces, you know, to lift up frontline narratives um, is tough, you know, to get in there. So having a participatory process enables more connectivity immediately within the community to make that happen. Um, so that is very important to us. Uh, our process to do that is we have uh, six community advisory members. Like I mentioned, they, they have this expertise that they bring into it. Um, and uh, collective bodies entire, because they're organizers, they often have whole networks that are familiar with the work. Um, and we have, they're actually involved, our, our trajectory as a fund started as a, a funder collaborative. So we actually were funder driven. It was funders who knew that this was a need, communication su uh, support and grant making was a need in our community, came together but they noticed immediately that they were not having the kind of impact. They were not seeing the, the portfolio grow in the way that they wanted or that they, they themselves did not have the reach into the communities that they wanted to be supporting. So that is where this process started opening up. Um, they started bringing, bringing in community members, um, staffing, and then it has taken us, I would say it's taken us four years to get to where we are now. So initially, initially we started as a community advisory group uh, at least that, that part of the work, um, that was providing guidance and recommendations to um, our board. And then the board of funders would have final decision-making power. Um, and so, you know, when I came on board as ED, it was really important to me that we be in true alignment with our intention. And so we actually ceded decision-making power to our community advisory board. And that was significant. That really demonstrated um, trust and it demonstrated our commitment to this process. Uh, I also opened up our board so that it was not funder only, <laughs> and we brought the longtime community advisory uh, board members into our board so that we are now co-governed in that regard. And that became more of a uh, subcommittee. Our community advisory board became a subcommittee where we could also foster deeper connection and bring people in to, to serve that purpose, but maintain community involvement in the strategic direction of our fund. So these are all our deeper ways. Um, we see those as measures of success. So when we now, when we look to community processes, um, we actually look to ha see how much trust has been uh, built between those who are holding power and those who are influencing power, how much invitation is there to actually be an active member of the structure. We really look for power sharing. And we look, in our own portfolio, we look for where there's connectivity, where we are coordinating between people, where there's strength happening between organizers in different regions across the nation, um, where that is showing up, again, in um, the different media platforms that we're accessing, the narratives that are being lifted up from that work. That's really important. Um, in some cases, we're looking at the success of the projects themselves. I think Black Farmer Fund is a really good example of that. Um, and the, the immediate success that they've had in their work is just, it has to do with how deeply embedded they are in the reach that they're having and all of the support that they're receiving throughout the community. So all, that's unification, coordination. It's, that's a heavy lift. 
of a lot of people making it happen. It's a good reminder, you know, when I think about words like advisory or participation, sometimes advisory implies I'm outside of this thing and I give input. Like, and, and then that input may or may not be received. I might advise my partner to take out the trash and then I'm gonna come home tonight and find out what happened or didn't, right? Um, and I think it's an interesting question and in thinking through, is there a difference between participatory design and community controlled capital? Um, and for people who may have had maybe an advisory board in the past, but that didn't quite get to the level of participating in the governance or participating in the control of capital, how do you kind of take that leap um, from kind of advisory to more participatory? Yes, um, so advisory to participatory to community control, those are all, yeah, that's all um, a transition. Um, they are distinct processes, and sometimes we, we have, you know, our, our initial structures of funds and, and projects are in such a way that it would be hard to just become community controlled, right? That takes time to be able to hand over, because that really means the administrators, everyone who's making the decision along the way is within community, is embedded within community. They are community members who are driving their own solutions and therefore have the best information, first-hand information. Um, as you were saying earlier about who holds the gold, they are the gold. <laughs> um, and so they, that's really community controlled. It's about lifting up that, that um, structure. But, you know, for those of us out here where we, we are not really, we're not kind of community controlled in that regard. Actually, we are a donor advised fund. Um, we have an a, administrator that's a community foundation, and then we have this amazing structure embedded within that. And I think our role in that universe is really important because it demonstrates how feasible it is, even within that kind of a structure, within a community foundation that doesn't have a participatory process itself. Um, they're enabling us to model this and influence. We, we definitely see ourselves as movement. We are funders as movement partners, and that affects how we, you know, look at each aspect of the work that we're doing, our program development, how we work with the community advisory committee. Um, but we also are out here helping other, providing technical assistance to other funders to actually transition them to participatory models in the hope of shifting that power in a bigger way, getting funders in the room with community members so that they can understand each other's language, each other's um, hopes, dreams, and sometimes limitations. <laughs> um, so that is part of our work. And I think that's, you know, it, often we actually started as advisory first. They were informing and making recommendations, um, but we were able to grow it into you know, seeding now for the last two years, it's been 90% of our grant capital to our community advisory committee. So I think that's significant for us to grow in that way. That's remarkable, yeah, to have 90% of capital ultimately transferring through community. Um, I have two questions here from the audience, and that means that if there are more folks with questions, don't be shy, because we might actually get to, uh, get to answer them. And I see that we do have a few more here that I can take a look at. Um, so, I want to invite everyone to share where are you seeing the most friction in your processes or when you might have seen challenge, whether you're able to work through or around or just have to acknowledge it being there. And the flip side of that are what are some of the wins where, you know, sometimes they say when we, when we move together, we move slower, but we go further, right? That, that sometimes going through that process and that friction um, can ultimately create great outcomes. Um, so a, a point of friction and a, and a point of victory uh, that you might want to share through your model. Maybe I can start. Yeah, I, I guess the friction is if we're not very careful about uh, the cohort members uh, that we select. So this can give rise to a whole host of issues, right? Um, so, and then because we are setting up a program to address a specific problem, uh, we need to be able to find the right uh, type of entrepreneurs who have developed an innovative solution to be able to address that uh, uh, problem. So sometimes it might take, take us a bit longer, you know, the, the whole recruitment process of the of cohort members to be able to find the right type of uh, entrepreneurs who can be put together 
uh, in a room and have that uh, candid uh, discussion um, and, that, and build that trust uh, uh, between them, uh, definitely. So it's mainly the selection process and then carefully also facilitating that session to ensure that um, you know, we build that trust uh, factor within, within, uh, during the program uh, as well. And also when we're selecting the companies, we need to make sure that we're not, for example, selecting two companies that are competitors, right? Because this will inhibit their ability to be able to share and give feedback. So it's an extremely, extremely intentional uh, uh, process and very, you know, it has, for it to work, uh, that, that whole setup, facilitation and selection process uh, has to be very carefully curated. So that poses, uh, you know, friction, definitely. Yeah, I think I would, um, you know, echo a lot of those thoughts as well in terms of how we were even building the community advisory board. We um, really wanted movement leaders to be the ones who selected um, the participants in our community advisory board. I mean, it'd be easy for us to say, oh, I know this person. I think they'd be really great to be on the board. I love their background and the, you know, the perspective they bring. But we really, you know, because we put it out to such a wide group and folks who are not part of our organization, not embedded um, in, our, in our work, were the ones saying, from my movement-oriented lens, this is who I think should be on the board to really influence the direction of the fund. You know, we definitely have um, a diverse background of folks in our community advisory board. And so, you know, when we're thinking about how we're setting the priorities for the fund and who we're going to lend to, um, you know, we can have a wide range, you know, of perspectives on that in the fund. And, you know, from folks who, you know, may have a more traditional lens in finance to folks who are like, that's not catalytic enough, you know, we need to go deeper. And so it's really, you know, how do we kind of build um, consent? Um, we have a consent-based uh, decision model so that, you know, for us, that allows everyone to bring their voice forward and not feel like I have to succumb to saying yes or no. Um, and so, uh, so it's been really interesting. And I think, you know, part of the win is that they've really learned from each other and really been able to see like the different um, perspectives and ways of evaluating how we want to shape our investments and who we're investing in. When we're identifying potential investment opportunities, it first goes through the community advisory board to say, you know, yes, I would like to see you move forward into the next stage of, of underwriting. And then we have a pre-screen um, evaluation where they specifically evaluate based on impact. And then the community advisory board it would, and the other credit committee members then say, yes, let's go into full underwriting. So really there's all of these different um, stages where they're actually giving us kind of that go, no go decision. And it's really kind of facilitating those critical conversations to make that decision about how do we move forward. And, you know, and then that has actually led us to the place where every loan that we've put forward to the credit committee has been approved. And I think that has a lot to do with, you know, that deep thought and facilitated conversation on the front end with the community advisory board and they have actually, at this stage, um, set uh, the priority for um, the you know um, eight loans that we made earlier in the fund. And since they've been on the credit committee, have approved um, nine loans, which totals to over 24 million um, in about 60 uh, percent of the f just over 40 million that Olamina has allocated. And I think it's a really great point that Leslie raises that oftentimes when people are asked for their participation or to give an opinion on something, it's at the 11th hour of approve this or don't approve this. And it can feel really hard to stop a train that's in motion. And the idea of having the very first screen go through the committee, right, to be able to say, let's make sure that we're getting that input nice and early an opportunity to weigh in on what are the questions that even need to be asked, right? Because often the, the thing about impact is that it's what you're asking or not asking that makes such a big difference. And do you even know what to ask depending on the needs of that particular community? So having that input both at the beginning and then at the end kind of creates that comprehensive element. So just to think about in your participatory structures, if you're just asking for that feedback at the end, it can be really difficult for people to feel like they have full agency uh, to be able to contribute their ideas. 
um, I want to make sure for Esperanza to be able to, to chime in there. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, a, a, a friction and a win for me is actually the, the same thing, which is um, the friction sometimes is as executive director, you know, we have seeded that, that decision making and so to stay true to it, sometimes I'm sitting on the side going, but, but strategically, but if, we, but if we did it this way, but if we, um, so that's, and that's hard, that's a friction for me to step back and really appreciate the process. Um, and then the win is that we have such engaged folks that if I have curiosities around that, if I have a need, I can actually just ask them. I can ask them one-on-one. -on -one. I really tap into the advisory aspect of what they offer because it's an amazing resource. Um, and so I can speak to people one-on-one. -on -one. We can have, you know, in our group process, make sure there's questions to address it. And so to me, that's a win to have such a great resource. But it is, it is tough sometimes. <laughs> It's fantastic in thinking about that as a learning opportunity. And then I think also sometimes in that structure of it can be hard to have that humility to say, okay, I have my opinion, which is different, but maybe there's a good reason to not prioritize my opinion in this moment and to trust this process. Um, and that that might mean maybe I need to kind of sit with my, my feeling about that, right? I have a right to my feelings, but I'm going to... Um, kind of remind myself what's the outcome that we're trying to achieve through this process and what can I really learn from this moment both in terms of my own reaction and in terms of the information being offered. Um, we have a couple questions here um, that I really love, thank you community, um, that are about the experience of the community members that join these community advisory boards. Um, that some, as, as Leslie had alluded to, you know, may have not interacted with financial terms as much. Um, uh, someone had written here, you know, people who may come from different educational backgrounds. How do you help create as safe of an environment as possible for people to feel comfortable coming in? And then also, um, another question I really love here, thank you whoever you are, um, what might community members perceive as risks to their participation? Um, and how do you mitigate those risks, right? They're now putting their name um, on this project, you know, what, what are the ways that they need to think about uh, the risks or that you as organizers might think about the risks that attribute to community members? Oh, oh you know what, I'll kick off that one. Um, in terms of the, um, the risk part, because we are working with movement leaders and organizers who are folks used to taking on, you know, power, um, they don't hesitate at all to let us know if we're, <laughs> they let us know. Um, so, you know, we, we have not run into a situation where we've been at, at you know, in a big risk, but I do, I do think that, for instance, some of the resource or advisory boards that I participate in, folks are selected for their ability to speak to that so that they can help steer out of, out of risk or at least know very well why you're taking on that risk. Um, so that's been that experience. And the other question about um, how to help support folks. So we intentionally bring folks on who may not have had that experience because they have this wealth of information that we're actually trying to infuse into our work, which may not be about how to, you know, grant allocations and strategic directions of grant programs. Um, we are just really open and welcoming to them. We offer technical, our, our work, we try to stay true to our intention around how we provide training throughout. So whether it's internally, we take, you know, bias trainings together. We do things together to help coach and get us on the same page around what we're doing um, and are just really supportive, understanding. And I think, you know, the, the bottom line for us is love. We, we love our community. We're doing this together for a reason. And so I think that really is threaded through our practices. Yeah, I'm not sure if uh, this applies to us in terms of the community participation part, but maybe I can uh, comment a bit about the, the advisory board that we set up for the for the programs. Um, they do, I mean, we're very intentional also about that makeup, that it includes um, individuals from, uh, you know, the local, uh, the local ecosystem, uh, local players who understand the challenges, and then also players from the global ecosystem as well who are who have the sector expertise but are very keen also to learn about what are the emergent uh, you know problems and what are the innovative solutions that are 
uh, taking place in those uh, localities. So I think from a learning uh, perspective, it's, it's been extremely re rewarding for uh, the advisory uh, board members. Many of them bring a lot of technical uh, know-how to the table, but also they, they absorb a lot uh, uh, in the process as well, in terms of what's happening on the ground. Yeah, I also really appreciate this question. Um, you know, it was really interesting, I think, when we really started kind of seeing um, differences in experiences for the community advisory board members is when they actually started um, moving towards participating in the credit committee. And, um, you know, and, and when we, we intentionally went through like a training to kind of step through kind of how we move through our process and typically what we prioritize and brought in um, another uh, community movement leader um, in the finance sector to kind of help and provide some guidance and input. And it was really funny, the person who comes from, um, who has a finance background kept asking like, well, what's the credit box? Like, how do I make a decision about yes or no? And we're like, we're trying to break that model, you know? <laughs> and everything is really on um, an individual level and evaluation and so, you know, here's really what what we're hoping to achieve by making these loans, and and you know, and and here's how we're kind of moving away from this you know preconceived notion of risk. And so there was a lot of unlearning for her to have to do. Um, and then I would say, you know, on the other end of the spectrum, from somebody who comes from a community where there was just such a lack of access to um, finance and um, and and you know, in capital and just really kind of understanding the system and how that works, you know, was just really, um, you know, more curious and I think felt a little intimidated at first. And so as a team, we were able to kind of talk through like what one of, what one of the credit memos were like and, and really explain like, here's what we look at, here's why we're evaluating this. And it really helped her feel more comfortable with bringing her voice forward. And I think the other um, part of it to create like a safe and comfortable space for them is in this two-step process where we start off with this pre-screen memo, I think particularly for the first one, um, we had folks provide comments um, in the document themselves. And on the first one, we were really intentional because founding partners of Candide are also participating in the credit committee as the managing members of the fund and so we asked them, you know, Morgan and Anair, to not put their comments in first um, so that the community advisory board members, you know, didn't feel like intimidated by what they were seeing. And when we had our first full credit committee meeting, which included Morgan and Anair, you know, really kind of um, did a lot of level setting in that space and were really intentional about um, bringing their voices forward. And, um, and it, so it's just, it's really been, I think, a nice collaborative effort for them to like feel the strength in what they had to say. And the hardcore movement leaders, to your point, really did not have any issue with bringing forward like their ideas and thoughts, so. Absolutely. Um, okay, I, I'm gonna ask two more questions and I want this first one, anyone who's super inspired to answer, uh, to go ahead and jump in, uh, but it's another great question. If you can speak to how your community advisory board or structure um, influenced how returns were perceived and defined. And I can think about that question quite broadly. There's returns to investors, there's returns to community, there's returns to the people involved, of, of how has it uh, shifted your frame perhaps about returns? I'll say that, um, so I came out the gate wanting data to, you know, I, I entered in when we had a 10 year portfolio and I was like, okay, what have we been doing? You know, I'm saying, take it over this. Also, honestly, have we been trash or are we doing the right work? I mean, <laughs> I was just as ready to, you know, if we have, I'm all about transparency and what difference can we make? So. <laughs> We have not been, we've done a great job. <laughs> I was really excited to see after 10 years, you know, so much <laughs> impact. But I often have those questions. Um, and when I bring that to the community advisory, I think I get a bit of a pushback around how I'm thinking about um, data, what I'm thinking, you know, it's because it's, 
they, it has roots in extractive models of thinking um, and being and doing with community. And I, so I appreciate that pushback. Um, and I think that it's really made me look at other aspects of our relational aspect and how those relationships, the connectivity is uh, strengthening the work that we do. So it's really shifted my thinking into that. And how, you know, how do we then define, are there measures or how, just how do we look at it differently? So I have been working at that and, and moving away from, you know, using an impact measure type modeling. I'll give one example. There's a, a group uh, called the Right Relations Collaborative. And this year they had a, the collaborative is through a Native community. They have an advisory board that's um, their auntie's council that works with uh, impact investor. And the impact investor came in wanting to create an impact report and they got same similar pushback. So instead of doing an impact report, they actually created a reciprocity report. And I just thought that was a brilliant concept. And I think that demonstrated that shift to relational thinking. And so now I've been looking at, okay, how do we, what's a hybrid model? How do we, so I, I think to answer the question, I think that is my shift in terms of return. I love that in terms of just the openness to saying you can let that process transform your own way of showing up in leadership and what it means in your role and that that takes a lot of openness and courage. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I mean, I think in our case of a loan fund, I would look at return in a couple of ways. One, when we're really evaluating the financial strength of an organization, it's really their ability to cover the debt service as well as their ability to repay the loan. And so I think to the other person's question, which I didn't fully touch on about the risk, that is the risk. You know, if, if one of our community, if our community advisory board credit committee is like, we love the impact of this, but, you know, at the end of the day, um, the organization is really not able to absorb um, that debt service, then that's detrimental to them. So that's something we need to be critical in our evaluation of. And their ability to repay the loan, what impact does that have on the fund as, you know, particularly as, as a fund that, you know, we're trying to demonstrate the power of making these types of investments if all of a sudden we're showing that folks aren't really able to do this and we're, you know, financially not able to sustain the fund. That's a big um, part for us. I think to this other question of um, like where has a shift been, you know, we were designed early on where our only revenue source is the um, interest income that we make. So basically the margin uh, that we make off the cost of our capital, which was low to begin with, thankfully. Um, and so, you know, and as we were kind of moving further into the fund and a lot of the community advisory board members were like, we need to invest in like these types of initiatives, which really, I mean, need true patient, low cost capital. And we had to really, you know, take a look at how can we still sustain ourselves as a startup emerging fund um, financially while, you know, we're trying to make these really deep, impactful loans. And so for us, as we're now entering into the second phase of the fund, um, we're really rethinking our um, financial model and our revenue model and um, seeing how hopefully you know, we can kind of, I don't like the word subsidize, but I mean, it's like, you know, say to investors, maybe 100% isn't the right expectation to have when you're doing this work. You know, what if you got 80% back, you know, and so um, that we can use, um, you know, the, that extra buffer to really do the type of um, investments that we know we need to make. It's a great reminder that often when we're saying returns, the money comes from someone to someone, right? And what's the, um, the wealth division between those two parties? Who is in a position uh, to absorb that and being really transparent and thoughtful about it um, being a critical component? Um, I'm going to invite everyone to take a minute on one final question. I'm going to just make an assumption that everyone is inspired to go back to their organizations and think through how can I bring a more participatory model to what I'm doing, whether that's actually through community controlled capital or as we talked about kind of working away um, up a spectrum of advisory to participatory to community control and what are kind of the readiness phases at each of those, right, to um, be able to think about that transition. What is a thought or a question that you might invite people to take back home um, to, to think about what their next step could be on that journey. 
maybe, maybe a thought to leave you with. Uh, so we have, I mean, we have so many, you know, problems arising, environmental, social, economic, and they're all place-based uh, problems. And there are place-based solutions out there. But, however, unfortunately, people who are, you know, coming up with these innovative uh, solutions are not being heard, they're not being, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, consulted, they're not part of any uh, uh, process, and they're completely overlooked. So how can we, all of us as organizations, make sure that we reach those people with the innovative solutions who are on the ground, understand what the problems are, and have developed those solutions, and we're able through you know our work to be able to reach them and provide them with all the necessary resources, be it capital or social, uh, uh, financial or social capital, to help them uh, address those uh, problems. Yeah, I think this is really um, making me think of an example that we were talking about at lunch with um, Candide's impact team. Um, Starkey being in the room as well. We just had our first impact report um, that was launched and I come from organizations where we say like, these are our goals. This is the impact that we believe needs to happen to like see um, improvement in communities and, um, and to build wealth. And as we were going through this process, we really kind of shifted that model and said, well, what does impact look like for you? What are your goals? How do you measure success? And how can we help you and be in support of that? And so that's really what our impact report has turned into of like, okay, what were the goals of the companies and how, how are they in like achieving that? So we're not saying this is what we think impact means. And so I think that's really kind of the thought of like, you know, what's guiding, um, I think your assumptions and, and decisions, I mean, I think so often we see that we're kind of coming into community saying, this is how we think it needs to be. This is how we think, you know, um, you know, you can have like these types of solutions will work for you. It's really more listening to community first to guide your actions and decisions and structures and strategies. Yeah, I would say that actually um, we have ample opportunity each day to practice collective collective process. Every time we're on one of those calls and we're asking questions and we get crickets back, um, sometimes it's it's often you know the question you ask is the outcome you know that you achieve. Um, it's often just the nature of the question, and if we break them down into bite-sized pieces and really solicit responses from people, it's you know all the way down to rather than what do you think? Do you have any questions? You can ask everyone what, what's one thing you agree with, what's one thing you don't agree with, what's you know how do you feel about this particular thing? Each time we do that, we are creating a collective process and we're providing an opportunity to listen as much as for someone to express themselves. It's an opportunity to listen and to demonstrate you really do want to hear what they have to say. And the more we build that into everyday processes, I think the more benefit we reap from being able to have benefit from all the perspective that's coming into the work um, and to have more balanced thinking in what we're doing. So I, I would say we have ample opportunity to practice that collective, creating collective space, and that, that is, those tools are very much the tools that translate into participatory processes. 